Uh, hello, everybody. Um, okay, we're going to talk about ERSpan encapsulated routable spanning. Uh, so, uh, just a short review here. Uh, and let's just talk about port mirroring first. What is port mirroring? Uh, it's one of the most common networking troubleshooting techniques, is what the slide says. Uh, what it is, is a way, uh, since we uh, made the switch to uh, switched Ethernet, to uh, get a copy of packets that appear on a switch port. Um, as, I don't know, as recently as 2005, I would uh, have a problem trying to analyze a, a networking issue, and I'd have to go grab a, a, one of the old hubs uh, so that you could uh, put a sniffer on there and see what's going on. But with the port mirroring, now you can uh, tell the switch to send traffic that appears on one port and send it to another port. So it can be sent there for further analysis by a, uh, a, a device we call the uh, sniffer. I used to work for Network General back in the day, and, and they actually uh, copyrighted sniffer. So um, um, those are pretty familiar to most people now. Wireshark is uh, fairly common out there. So it's just a commodity product now. Uh, so we have span. That's just one that sends a copy of the monitor, monitor traffic to a local device, usually on the same switch. Okay. Um, remote switch port analyzer. It just adds a VLAN tag, and then that VLAN tag can be uh, sent across whichever switches are on the common uh, fabric there, and uh, a, a port that has the right VLAN. Configuration will pick up that packet. With uh, encapsulated remote span, we've added the uh, ability to take packets on a source port. They can be ingress or egress. Take those packets and wrap them up into uh, the generic routable encapsulation. Encapsulation. I'm a little redundant there. To extend the basic port mirroring capability from layer two to layer three. So this is a huge feature here. Uh, used to be if you wanted to do some sniffing on a network, you'd have to be in somewhat proximity to it or have somebody in proximity to it to do that. Uh, with this capability, now you can have a problem on a switch someplace in uh, San Francisco and have uh, uh, this encapsulated remote span. Uh, take that packet, uh, encapsulate it in GRE and send it to a sniffer up in uh, Seattle or here in Vancouver or wherever in the world you want it to go. That's a, that's a pretty big thing uh, for people who have to uh, monitor and diagnose network problems. So here's a port mirroring example. Uh, this is the old way of doing it here, um, where you had a sniffer attached to a switch, and you would tell that switch to say, hey, send a copy of everything on uh, port A. Uh, ingress and egress to uh, a sniffer over on some other port on the switch. Uh, R-SPAN, just like I said, added a VLAN tag to it. Uh, but with ER-SPAN, we now mirror traffic on source ports and delivers the mirrored traffic to destination ports, and it's a routable across a layer three network now. So um, again, with you know software-defined networking taking off, uh, Global networks, uh, uh, non-co-located networks, so many different networking configurations out there. It's really uh, a great feature to be able to uh, uh, get a, uh, look at data that appears on a problematic source port over on a switch someplace in the world and uh, get a look at that traffic uh, on your sniffer wherever you may be. So. Um, ERSpan was added to Linux. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, 4.14. I think the full implementation went in 4.16. 4.15 was a little transitory. Uh, we were able to do this because Cisco released the specification in 2014. I have a pointer to that uh, IETF document uh, at the end of the slides. And um, people should look at it if they're interested in working on this because there's still further things that could be done with this. But it includes a re transmission reception uh, based on the existing IP GRE and IP6 GRE kernel modules. Um, building on top of those really simplified the implementation quite a bit, I think, rather than going off and building an entirely new driver and, uh, 
and taking that route, I think it made real sense to just put these into the IPGRE and IP6GRE modules and uh, made it easier for me to backport it to out of tree kernel modules as well. So this allows Linux to act as an ER span traffic source. You can send ER span packets, you can receive ER span packets. And one of the kind of nice features about this is uh, these ER span packets, th if you have reception set up for it, the kernel will strip off all the uh, outer layer stuff and you will see a packet as presented to a user uh, at some endpoint. And so um, it also allows for odd things like you can set up an ER span tunnel and use it like a GRE tunnel with the extra overhead. There's no reason to do that, but it's an interesting sort of side feature about this. And uh, the ER span feature is available with native tunnel support and uh, metadata mode tunnel support, or, or what some people call lightweight tunnels. Um, I prefer metadata mode myself. I think it's more descriptive. So here's some common ER span use cases. You can debug network issues by tracking the control and data fr frames. Um, seeing as how GRE is used to encapsulate these packets that are appearing on a source port, there's going to be some limitation in the uh, amount of, uh, or, or the, the speed at which you can capture and then uh, take these frames and send them on over to another uh, point on the network for analysis. So I think, you know, it's probably more useful for debugging control issues. Uh, you can, as it mentions, there's voice over IP, packets for delay and jitter analysis. Uh, you can do some latency analysis. Uh, most, uh, uh, you know, of your usual uh, round trip times in the millisecond range, you can do some fairly good latency analysis with those. Obviously, if you start getting down into very small uh, packet uh, interframe gaps, then the latency analysis might not work in those cases. You'll have to be closer to the situation. But, you know, if you're having problems with the uh, 60 second nanosecond gaps, you're probably going to want to get closer to the uh, source of the problem anyway with a, a piece of networking equipment. And you can uh, monitor your tra network traffic for anomalies. There's all sorts of uh, um, you know, artificial intelligence that you can apply to packet streams that you capture at a remote port, send back for analysis, uh, get an entire conversation, and then do some analysis of what's going on on those uh, traffic connections. Here's the ER span packet example. Uh, it only works on Ethernet, so far as I know. I, I think uh, the specification allows for other types of frame types, packet types. Um, but uh, as of now, only Ethernet is uh, supported. So you have your Ethernet IP header, GRE, generic routing encapsulation, then your ER span header. So there's two types of ER span headers. We'll get into those. And then uh, again, it, it only encapsulate, uh, encapsulates ether type packets. So that's why I show ether. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be IP as the uh, uh, layer three network header, but uh, generally is. Is there a plug in the mic? Uh, here, let, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so. And here's some ER span uh, tunnel setup examples. Um, you may have a bunch of physical machines on some, you know, network X, Y, or Z out there. These links are uh, all connected to a Cisco switch. It's a 10.1.1.0 network. Uh, via 10.1.1.2, it's connected to a uh, Cisco switch, which then uh, does some routing and uh, and sends the ER span tunnel data to the sniffer. Uh, another example, and this is one I'm most familiar with here, is where you have a, a machine and it's running a bunch of virtual machines. 
uh, you know, you have a bare metal machine, it's got KVM or some other type of hypervisor loaded, it's got some uh, virtual machines running on it, they each have their own network addresses and their own capabilities, but uh, Open vSwitch will allow you to set up an ER span tunnel and take uh, traffic that appears on uh, one of the ports on that Linux machine and again send it on over to a sniffer. And then uh, just, uh, a, just a Linux box sitting on a network someplace out there in the world. Uh, they, they've got Linux net devs, they can set up an ER span native or lightweight tunnel and again uh, get that traffic across a routable network over to a sniffer where uh, issues can be analyzed and resolved, hopefully. All right, so uh, the Linux native tunnel versus the metadata mode tunnel. There are two types of tunnel implementations in the Linux kernel. Uh, there's the native tunnel and uh, the metadata mode lightweight tunnel. Uh, for more information on lightweight tunnels, if you're interested, uh, Thomas Graff wrote an article that was very useful to me to kind of uh, figure out what's, what the difference is there. So I have a link there. It's also at the end of the slides. So. First, we have the native tunnel, and that is cr created with a per-tunnel specific configuration. In other words, you're creating a network device. This network device has specific uh, tunnel configurations for uh, key, IP address, any other uh, types of encapsulations or, or uh, options that are um, specific for that type of tunnel, okay? So we can create a GR, there's an example there done with a GR uh, tunnel where you say, hey, we want to have sequence numbers. Here's the key, the local IP, and, uh, and you can just add that as a, a tunnel. And it will work pretty, pretty darn well, but there's a result of that. For each tunnel, you have to create another net device. And so that does not scale well across large deployments which are very common these days. So, um, With metadata mode tunnels, uh, this resolves a scaling issue. You create one, okay, one net device, but it represents multiple tunnels. And these multiple tunnels are represented through the metadata that is presented uh, to the tunnel when you want to transmit and encapsulate a packet. Um, metadata mode that comes along it will have a, quite a di few different fields in there. You, you, you'll just have to look at them, see what's available to you there as far as metadata. But it is a way of encapsulating all the data that was generally used for the uh, native tunnel into, that's now in this metadata mo mode structure, which is passed in, and that's used to create and encapsulate a packet at that level. So um, Open vSwitch uses lightweight tunnels. I think uh, they're, they're far more useful. Um, for most things. Native tunnels, you know, there's some appropriate uses there. And uh, in the Linux kernel, um, you can see an example of a lightweight tunnel using eBPF. Um, my colleague William wrote up a lot of that code, I think. And uh, you can go look at that and see an example of a lightweight tunnel with uh, eBPF and how it works. It's, uh, of course, a trivial example, and it's mostly, of course, self-tests. It's intended to just make sure that uh, the basic uh, kernel uh, support is there. It's not intended to be a complete uh, tutorial, of course. But it's uh, helpful for somebody like me. I've never worked with EPF, lightweight tunnels. I, I come from a very device-oriented background, so uh, it's, a, it, was a, it was a useful example for me, and I hope you can find it uh, useful as well. So. Our ER span protocol headers, let's talk about ER span protocol headers. All right, again, we've already seen this, uh, the outer packet header, the ether IP, GRE, ER span. Uh, we'll talk more about the types of ER span headers as we come up here. But uh, the GRE is a fixed byte header with a sequence number. Um, GRE flags allow a number of different options for GRE, but uh, it's mandatory for uh, ER span to only uh, specify the sequence number in the flags for the GRE header. Um, an interesting bug occurs if you try to, well, it just doesn't work and it breaks horribly. If you try to set anything, so they'll do it. Just uh, sequence number only and uh, uh, that, that'll work for you. 
Uh, you can see there, there are two types of uh, ER span. There's ER span type 2, ER span type 3. You can look at the uh, next protocol uh, header type in the uh, GRE um, header, and that'll tell you what type of ER span header is going to follow. So let's go off and look at the GRE header. Uh, as you can see there, uh, um, I didn't call it out, but in the flags you see that, that that one, that bit set to one there, that's the sequence number, and all others should be zero. Okay, and then you have a 16-bit protocol type for ER span there. Uh, again, we call that out, uh, hex AABE for type 2, hex 22BE for type 3, and these are assigned numbers, and uh, then the, the sequence number uh, which is what really makes sense here for this type of situation, allows you to see if, well, if a uh, GRE packet got lost in transmission on its way to you, you can go and look at the sequence numbers of the packets you're receiving and see if there's any holes in the data uh, that that's being presented to you from the source port that you're trying to monitor. So that can uh, be very helpful in debugging situations. So here's our ER span header. It's version 1, type 2. Um, don't ask me what happened to version 1 or v version 0, type 1. I never saw it. So uh, presumably it died on the testing table. But uh, we have an ER spin header version 1, type 2. And uh, this one, you have a VLAN. Uh, the, that's the original VLAN that the packet, the, uh, the source packet that the source monitoring port was on. A class of service. Uh, it's derived from the packet, the VLAN and capsulization type. I think that would be, uh, there's like trunk or non-trunk. I think it's uh, it, it related to that type of, whether it's a trunk VLAN or not. Um, the uh, truncation, well, indicates if uh, this packet had to be truncated in order to make it across the network to you. Uh, obviously, if you're adding headers and all these good things to a packet in order to send it across a routable network to get to somebody, for analysis uh, somewhere else in the world, uh, that's going to add uh, data to the packet and it may have to be truncated. Uh, the, the encapsulated packet may have to be truncated in order for it to reach you. So uh, that's an indication of that. Then there's a uh, session ID. Okay, the session ID uh, is uh, set when you uh, configure the tunnel. And then the index uh, can be used uh, for whatever any particular user wants it to be used, or it's platform dependent. And I get the feeling it's just something that uh, user space can use for their own purposes there. I've not seen a lot of examples of that. Uh, William, did you? Yeah, yeah I, I, I haven't seen a lot of use of index for, for, for platform dependent uh, 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 uses at this point. But uh, as uh, this uh, technology matures, people get more familiar with it. Uh, I hope that people can make use of those fields. So there are, there are those two new IP Route 2 configurable fields in the Netlink API. There's the session ID and the index. Uh, and those are there for you to use as, you, as required for your purposes. Uh, ER span doesn't use the GRE key, so it repur repurposes the GRE key, uh, I key, O key for the session ID. Okay, and that's all just done via IP Route 2 when you configure the ER span tunnel. Uh, the index is also configurable via IP Route 2. Again, that's just, it's just passed through. It's for your application. It's for you to keep track of sessions or, or well, no, there's session ID. Uh, but it's for you to keep track of other things that you may want to know about that particular connection, that, that, uh, that monitoring port. Uh, the class of service and VLAN are extracted from the original frame. And then the truncate bit is set if uh, any of these conditions here are met. Um, we look at uh, all of those, and, and if any of them are set, then the truncate bit is set. So that's version 1, type 2. And uh, here is version 2, type 3. Okay, And as you can see, there's some additional information set into this frame, which can be very useful for people who want to uh, do uh, the type of uh, jitter analysis or latency analysis that we mentioned earlier. Um, again, we still have the VLAN class service uh, fields. We, there's an additional field now called batch short or oversized. So that's uh, a, a nice 
addition. So if you have a NIC card or a source port configured to collect bad, short, or oversized frames, then uh, those can be checked and uh, that uh, can be indicated with the encapsulated packet. Uh, you still have your truncation bit, your session ID. There's a 32-bit timestamp added now. Uh, that timestamp is just uh, from the pay time get real time. And I'm pretty sure that's 100 uh, microsecond granularity, I think, what, what I recall. Um, then there's a uh, security group tag. Uh, that is unused at this time. I can imagine uses for that, but there's no use for it right now. So if uh, somebody wants to make use of that, I'm sure patches are always welcome. Um, then there's the payload type and the frame type. Those are also unused at this time in Linux. Again, I think there's some great opportunities there to expand the implementation of ERSpan and to uh, get those to work. Uh, one thing I can certainly think of is it'd be nice to get frame relay or, or TPP or some other types of frame types supported uh, so that we can use these on not just Ethernet interfaces but WAN interfaces as well. I think that's uh, another useful uh, improvement that could be made. The hardware ID, I'm not sure. I kind of looked around and I can't figure out what that's about, but it always has to be four. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> William, do you know why? No, no. Yeah, yeah, see, uh, no, it's programmable. It's, it's, oh, it's programmable, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, then there's a direct, <laughs> moving along, uh, then there's a direction bit. Uh, that's for ingress, egress. Uh, there's a couple of bits for uh, granularity there. Uh, that will, that's, can be used to indicate the granularity of the timestamp. I mentioned right now it's all hard coded to the 100 microsecond uh, timestamp. Uh, so that's another place where some useful work could be done to improve this and allow for other types of granul granularities. Uh, with 100 uh, microsecond granularity, it's going to be tough to help with some types of jitter and, um, and latency. I mean, if your jitter and latency is long enough, then it will help you out, but th there's going to be times when, uh, many times when you're, it's just, the granularity is not quite uh, enough for us there. So I, I would hope that we can have some sort of uh, improvements made there. I'm thinking about it. Um, then there is the optional platform subheader. That is also unused at this time. Okay, um, just, uh, okay, yeah, so the type two, uh, uh, the version two type three implementation, and I stumble over that all the time, I hate it, version two type three. Anyway, uh, introduces another couple of fields uh, to the kernel through the Netlink PPI, the hardware ID, and the direction, uh, ingress or egress, so you can specify whether you want to get ingress data only or egress data only. Um, that's uh, good because uh, sometimes you don't care about what's happening in one direction. You just want to see what's happening in another, and especially in cases where uh, there is a lot of bandwidth on the on the port, it can help you uh, eliminate you know, maybe up to 50% of the bandwidth or more. Um, okay, again, the uh, class of service bad, short, oversized, and truncation fields are inferred from the mirrored frame, uh, and this is where uh, I've been talking about this. The timestamp value is calculated by calling the k time get real uh, kernel function. And at this time, only 100 microseconds is supported. Uh, the security group tag is hardly approached at zero. And I had mentioned that uh, uh, packet type, frame type is always uh, zero and one. And there's no implementation of subheaders yet either. So uh, here we have a Cisco ER span example. I take it that this works. I have not had a chance. <laughs> I don't have a Cisco switch. And <laughs> it works, it works. It wor <laughs> William assures me that it works. <laughs> and that we, uh, with, uh, okay, so here we have an example with Open vSwitch. Now this one's a little uh, closer to my domain. And I, I like this. I, um, uh, I got it from the paper that uh, uh, William was working on and then, uh, mentioned Joe Stringer was a guy who, he wrote a paper that explained how you could do this or something. 
But anyway, we got into it, looked at it, and here's a way you can use uh, it. You, of course, you have to have the user space ex executables for Open vSwitch installed. But the Open vSwitch KO just comes with the 4.19 kernel. And so uh, you just do your OBS DBCTL. You add a, a, a data path. Uh, then you can go ahead, if you have a namespace, NS0, pure VF1, whatever, you go ahead and add that uh, virtual Ethernet device to your, uh, to your data path. Then you can go ahead and, uh, now uh, again, OBS uses lightweight tunnels, so you want to use the IP link com command to create a lightweight tunnel. It's the external keyword that does that. And then you take your uh, ERSpan tunnel, add it to your data path, now, um, you know, op open vSwitch is open flow. So you have to add a flow to make things happen. You go ahead and add that flow. This is an example one. It's a trivial example. But you substitute the right parameters, and it'll all work for you. And note that the open vSwitch daemon is not required in this case. Normally, people are going to run open vSwitch daemon, or they're going to run something else to manage the database. Uh, so, uh, but in this case, you can just do all this with native Linux, uh, well, and of course using the Open vSwitch uh, user space tool. Um, here's a Linux native mode tunnel example. Uh, note that I did this with the 4.19-R6 plus kernel and IP route 2 uh, of that particular version. Uh, things can move around a little bit on you with uh, kernel versions and IP route 2, so I just wanted to call that out. I think it should work with any, just about any recent kernel, but uh, I just like to call that out. So if there's any question or if uh, somebody tries this and it doesn't work, they'll know what, what I was working with to uh, get this to go. So in this case, uh, you see the example for using uh, just a native mode tunnel. It creates a net, de net device. We call it my, my ER span in this case. And there's the parameters for it. Uh, you cannot uh, start the filtering until you add a, a QDisk you know, so I create a QDisk and then add the filter to it, and, uh, and it starts to go. So um, here's a lightweight tunnel, ERSpan example with eBPF. And this is, again, this is based upon the self-tests that are in the, the Linux kernel. You can go look at the code yourself and see how that's all done. Um, it's, it's basically just a little bit different but you see where we add the uh, TC filter. This is really the basic, a big different step from the previous example is a TC filter to add the BPF uh, kernel uh, uh, program, a test tunnel kern.o. Uh, that source code is also in the self-test directory, so you can go look at it. And you tell it which section you want to use. And then again, you use TC to start the filter. <coughs> um, I don't know if uh, I might myself clear to everybody. I hope I'm, I'm trying to hold this thing up here. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, you know, port mirroring, a very common troubleshooting technique. Uh, reminds me of, I had to do this uh, SNMP Armon um, uh, type project on a router I worked on back in 1992, a long time ago. And so I looked at this when I was looking at ER span, I was going, this is like SNMP Armon. But uh, it doesn't use ASM1 or uh, SNMP at all. And I think it's, uh, it's probably a little more close to our heart as kernel type people. And you can uh, get this to work in the kernel. But uh, it does the same sort of thing. It takes packets from remote source and ships them off to somebody so that they can look at them and do their uh, uh, network analysis. And uh, the three primary ways, the open vSwitch kernel module with the data path tool native mode or span tunnels, or lightweight tunnels with EBF bytecodes. There's some additional resources, a couple things to look at um, that are related here. Uh, Cisco actually has a number of other good articles on. Just look up Cisco ER span if you are really curious to, you want to dig in depth on this. And uh, questions? Thank you, Bob. Hey, uh, in your Linux bare metal example, uh, your your IP link add uh, uh, command 
specified an ER span device type, which I assume implies a GRE encapsulation. Yes. Is it possible to specify a non-GRE encapsulated version of that device so that you can specify the encapsulation as something else with the lower device, i.e. IPsec or something like that? I don't believe so. I think at this point, uh, ER span is dependent upon GRE type encapsulation. <laughs> Anyone else? Ready? <laughs> good catch. <laughs> nice throw, good catch. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a sports thing at, uh, at the Plumbers Conference. So, um, <laughs> I had a question about security for this. Is, is it possible that, you're, you know, the, the mirror stuff can be man in the middle really easily because there's just, you know, kind of the, the sequence numbers are, n are not changing dramatically or are being checked? Is, are, I, was there, I was wondering if there's even basic kind of security concerns around this or is everything just going to be uh, on an internal network so there's just no problem ever? Yeah, it was related. Um, it was related. Yeah, you beat me yeah, to it. Yeah. That's a great question. And what I would say is at this point, it's a fairly new technology. <laughs> I, I would say, how much do you trust just a GRE tunnel? Okay. There's your answer. He doesn't trust it. So, uh, you know, there's probably room for a lot of enhancements and things we can do with this. But it is based upon GRE, and it, you're going to, however much you trust, it is how much you trust GRE. That, that would be my answer. Uh, I was just wondering, was there a way to decapsulate ER span before or to sniff it before this existed? Uh, well, it, it's a Cisco technology. So Cisco had ER span in their switches for. Yeah, no, I, I remember using it like a decade ago, but I oh. was wondering how I would have read it then. <laughs> like, uh, uh, excuse me. Can you TCP dump it or Wireshark it and still have it work even without this? Can you receive it with Wireshark, for example, without this? Uh, yeah. So, uh, the mirroring activity, you do not have to set up a receiver for it. You can just set this up to just send packets in a direction, and not worry about whether they're received at the other end or not. At the other end, if you have a wire shock shark that's sitting there, it should see the IPv4, GRE0, GREV0, and then if it's capable, if it's a newer wire shark, it should decode that's the ER span okay. packets. Okay. Okay, so this is doing both uh, encapsulation and decapsulation? It, we do have de decapsulation, yes. Oh, uh, okay. So, you, like I said, you can set up an ER span tunnel talking to each other, and you can do pings and send traf traffic to IPERPs and all kinds of neat stuff. You don't want to do that because of the overhead, but uh, uh, yes, there are receives at both ends. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Oh. Uh, this slide that is displayed is probably easier to do with the uh, tunnel key TC action than the uh, eBPF. It may be. I am, okay. Just a comment. Oh, okay, yeah, I, it just sure, sounds good. Uh, I, 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 I'm really very new to eBPF, so I, I, you know I, I have not used it much, and uh, that's probably one of the good reasons to be here is because I'm learning a lot about that here. So. Cool. All right, thank you, Greg.